Season 18, Season of Plunder, First Impressions, How We Looking, How We Doing. Sorry about the delay, King's Fall kinda took over my weekend. I'm back to normal now, so let's talk. I'm gonna start with story, as we usually do. I just gave a lot of praise to last season's story because it was really good. Like, it was, it was really good. Getting to learn about some characters, learning more about Kallus' plans for the future, everything felt linked to the overall story. This season feels a bit less so. So far, the story goes, the witness has freed Aramis from her stasis prison, and she's trying to hunt down some potentially dangerous MacGuffins, which is where we step in. We rescue the spider on behalf of the drifter, who gives us his catch, which becomes the basis for the seasonal activities. Given the name of the season, it's pirate themed. I had been told some feedback in my stream that claimed people were worried that Destiny is going to be too silly again, something along those lines, where people were worried that the game wasn't going to continue to be very serious, and this is not something I'm really worried about. I don't know how popular these comments were, if it was just like a one-off thing. When I think of tough marketing, I think of some of the original D2 launch marketing and tone, original D2 silliness that was just a bit much. I'm not really getting that from this season. Spider isn't posting cringe. Misrax is pretty much the same. Ido is a new character who everyone seems to love right now. Someone who's just very excited about these artifacts and the whole experience. And of course we have Drifter being his usual cheeseball self, but that's nothing new. That's just kind of how he's always been. If Bungie wants to have some fun with some names of enemies, you know, the first week's boss's name was I.I. I. There's a server named Scurvy. Let Bungie have their fun. A couple of names here and there on some enemies, and the fact that we're jumping onto some enemy ships, to me, does not indicate a dramatic tone shift back towards original D2 days. If anything, I'm guessing Bungie wanted to lighten the mood, considering Season of Haunted got pretty deep and pretty real. However, this does feel like a season, at least right at the start, that will not have as strong of a link to something like the calloused focus season we just had. I like when the seasons have a good link to the main story because it doesn't feel like we're just killing time waiting for the next thing to happen. I realize the witness is technically involved with the season, but we'll need to wait and see as to how much this season is really important to the overall storyline, especially since we just got teasers for Lightfall. We know it's gonna happen in six months, we don't know how we're gonna get there, but I'm skeptical about this season having that pull that drew me to Season of the Haunted, although I would be very happy to be wrong. The second week had some things get a little spicier between Misrax and the Spider. That was neat, love to see more of that. But I am worried about this season being Season of the Go Find the Weekly MacGuffin and bring it back and then Aramis is just irrelevant again. Gameplay-wise, we've got three things, Catch Crash, Expedition, and the Hideouts. Let's start with Catch Crash. The theming is great, the environments are great, and the gameplay is much more enjoyable than something like Containment. Lots of moving around, actual seasonal activity level mechanics in it, which is all very refreshing after three months of being stuck in the Castellum of the Leviathan Raid being the main activity for the season. Enemy density is mostly good. Don't have too many complaints there. A lot of shanks in one of the boss rooms. Wouldn't have minded seeing some more variety there, but that's a very minor complaint. I wish there were as many enemies in the servitor room as there were in the entire game. I want that to be the new standard. Just, just litter the world in Dregs and Vandals. Far more of an enjoyable experience when it comes to enemy density as well. The expedition is not as riveting. I'm not expecting too many changes here from how it's paced out right now, but it is still very much seasonal activity level activity, I guess. Things are a little sparse enemy density wise until you get to the boss section where there's a lot more stuff that spawns in, but you know, it's a seasonal activity. I understand we can't just be swarmed and stuff. The hideouts kind of fit in this category as well. I'm waiting to see if we're gonna be invading the same spaces over and over with a different big enemy at the end, or if we're gonna have different hideouts. I'm not sure how much my opinion of the activity will change either way, regardless of the new environments or not. For example, week two, 
we had a Mars Lost Sector that was refurbished into one of these hideouts. Didn't really change my enjoyment of the activity one way or the other. But I definitely will be enjoying Catch Crash and the other seasonal activities more than just running around in the Leviathan like we did last season. A quick take on Quicksilver Storm, which is the auto rifle exotic that you get from pre-ordering Lightfall. It's a pretty good auto rifle, but it's probably compounded by the fact that it's also a grenade launcher and it gets little mini homing rockets for bonus damage. If you hit a bunch of shots in a row, it feels like it puts out pretty good damage. The grenade launcher aspect of the weapon feels very strong as well, but the radius of the explosion is pretty small. Is this a gun you can live without until Lightfall? I very much think so. I assume you'll be able to get it when Lightfall drops or maybe the season after Lightfall, something like that. It's not going to be a pre-order only weapon and that's it. But unless you're a huge auto rifle lover who would absolutely use their exotic slot on this, this is not a desperate need for most people. But at the same time, if you're someone like myself who knows that they're going to be playing Lightfall and has a lot of interest in this weapon, then, you know, sure, go for it. But it's not dire. It's good, but it's not dire. I haven't really gotten to use many of the seasonal weapons yet. Weapons don't tend to be my focus at the very start of a season. Usually just more bum rushing around to the seasonal mods. But the visuals on the weapons are incredibly nice. Been seeing very, very good feedback there. One thing that has surprised me is Volt Shot, the new perk. I think Volt Shot is going to be very good in higher end content. It is essentially Kill Clip, but instead of a 30% damage buff, you get to Jolt the next target that you hit. We're going to talk about Jolt and this perk when we talk about Arc 3.0. Let's talk about Arc 3.0. I've gotten to spend a little bit of time on all the classes with Arc 3.0, and I think Arc 3.0 is gonna have a lot of fun value. I've been enjoying Warlock's Lightning Surge quite a lot with Crown of Tempest, but I'm definitely not sold on Arc 3.0's viability in the end game just yet, although I did just unlock Lightning Strikes twice and that does help my first impressions a bit. I think some people are being quite dramatic about Arc 3.0, though. I am certainly not being that dramatic when it comes to the release of this subclass, especially now that I am unlocking seasonal mods and we can kind of get to our full power again. Let's talk about the keywords, starting with Amplify. Relatively easy to proc. The speed boost is very nice for traversing different areas, although I will say I was not expecting the jump to be as nuts as it is while in speed boost mode. The only bummer about speed boost is that you're almost not allowed to do anything else while it's active other than slide because the moment you stop, it just ends. Amplify feels more like it's going to exist for the purpose of helping me proc other effects with the limited amount of things that will allow you to do that. Amplify is not exactly designed to proc other things. It fits very thematically with Arc. I think they nailed that aspect, but... In PvE anyway, I'm still questioning its endgame value a bit as enemies are still ridiculously accurate and sometimes it doesn't matter how fast you're running, you're still going to get hit by these enemies. The other keywords that we have are blinding and jolt. Blinding is pretty self-explanatory, it's been in the game for a long time, I don't really have that much to say on it. Jolt on the other hand I think is going to have some really good value. As an effect on its own, just in a vacuum, it's really strong. But at the moment, it feels tough to notice because I imagine most people are just running your typical Destiny content at level content, maybe below level content. Most targets in this kind of content are barely going to survive when they are hit with Jolt. So you are essentially just seeing a proc Trinity Ghoul shot go off in the middle of a crowd of enemies, which can make it feel underwhelming despite the fact that you're literally AoEing down entire groups of enemies. The times that I was hitting an enemy that could actually live for longer than two seconds, Jolt was putting in some serious work, just completely bursting down everything around it, similar in vain to Ignitions from Solar 3.0, except you didn't need to do anything to get to the Jolt part. It just happens at base. I ran a Legend Nightfall, and it felt pretty good there. On Master, I think it'll be even more satisfying when it comes to AoEing down some enemies, just because they're usually so tanky. The issue for me, yet again, is linked to endgame viability. What methods of jolting targets do we have? 
Titans have Lightning Grenade as a part of Touch of Thunder. Warlocks have Lightning Surge, and Hunters have Lethal Current. We have Spark of Shock, where Arc Grenades jolt targets, which is very, very good, especially when combined with Lightning Strikes twice. This is probably going to be the most common way we see jolt applied while on an Arc subclass. And then we have Volt Shot, which is the weapon perk I mentioned earlier, that will likely only be utilized on the Scout Rifle. It's on two other weapons, but you're probably only going to use it on the Scout. This perk is going to be basically tied with or surpassing Spark of Shock in terms of how often you can apply Jolt to targets. You just need to kill one thing and then reload. It'll also be quite safe thanks to the fact that you are going to be likely using it on the Scout Rifle. I don't think Lightning Surge is going to be a safe thing to use. I don't think Lethal Current is going to be super safe to use, but it definitely has a better chance than Lightning Surge. I, I want to try. I want to see if I can make these builds work, but I'm skeptical. Touch of Thunder is viable at least, but if you're chucking Lightning Grenades and a GM for Jolt procs, you might as well just go with Volt Shot, or you might as well just go with Spark of Shock. But is it okay if not everything is designed for endgame viability? I think so. I think... Some people were just hoping for the fact that it would be. It could still potentially be viable, though. I just unlocked Lightning Strikes twice. But the real test doesn't happen until GMs come out and until we have a season that doesn't revolve around Arc Mods. However, Jolt only essentially ignores all other aspects, literally and figuratively, of Arc 3.0. We're only in it for Jolt and we use no other parts, opting for grenades, when the entire identity of Ark is based on moving fast and meleeing stuff. But back to the main question, is it okay if not everything is designed for endgame viability? I think that's fine. I think Bungie wanted to nail the theme and experience for Ark maybe before they became worried about endgame viability, if they're even concerned with it at all. Again, we could just be jumping the gun, and maybe it's actually very good. Sometimes, just like an exotic might be designed, it's not about the viability. It's about the uniqueness or the flavor of a thing existing that makes the experience. And in that regard, Ark is definitely hitting those flavor and theming marks. It just so happens that what Ark does for endgame content is not as valuable compared to something like Solar 3.0. The next batch of videos I'm going to be doing are going to focus on builds for each class like we do with Solar. So perhaps after some more intense digging around, we're going to find some stuff that is going to be viable at the top end. But for right now where I'm at, I'm going to enjoy using it in the stuff that I'm doing most of the time, which is stuff where I am at level and even slightly above level. Even going into a Legend Nightfall was pretty fun with Ark. I pulled my Twitch chat to see who they thought the winner of Ark 3.0 was, and 76% of the vote went to Hunters with only 6% going to Warlocks. Most people said it was because of the new super and because of Blink, with some other minor reasons thrown in there as well. Gathering Storm, it's pretty fun to use. I'm glad the staff gets thrown with a good amount of speed to it, and the damage on it is really good as it's been discovered, especially with Star Eater scales, which have been reverted back to four orbs to get maximum power. Hunters also have one of the easier combos to make happen in Lethal Current, Flow State, and Liar's Handshake, allowing for some really high damage output on single target, along with jolting targets, allowing for some AoE to happen as well. That being said, I'm not the hugest fan of the flow of the Liar's Handshake build, but we'll talk about that in another video. And like I mentioned earlier, there are some grenade shenanigans that I would like to try out. While most people feel like Warlock got the short end of the stick, I've been having quite a good amount of fun with Lightning Surge and Crown of Tempest. However, the issue with this build is that to keep things chaining as aggressively as something like Solar 3.0, you need to almost be playing by yourself as it really requires precise timings to optimize this build to its maximum potential. I wasn't completely 100% optimized with my build though, so perhaps making a fully kitted set will help alleviate some of that frustration. On Titan, I just tried a semi-optimized build with lightning strikes twice and enhancing my grenades, and it wasn't impressing me as much as I wanted it to be. Again, maybe some more optimizations will help, you know, impress me more. I was having some issues where the buff from lightning strikes twice would be disappearing and reappearing. It felt like it was getting overwritten by knockout sometimes. Not really sure what was going on there. I got to do some more research. 
Also, Thunderclap really needs to get changed so that it can be activated anywhere. Right now, if you are within melee range, normal range of a target, even if you've changed your keybinds to always use a charged melee, it still just defaults to the normal melee. I think once that gets changed or fixed or whatever, you're going to see a lot more people thunderclapping some cheeks. Speaking of mods, the seasonal artifact, we have a lot of community favorites this time around. We got Overload Bow, Anti-Barrier Scout, Unstoppable Pulse is probably neutral on that list. Unstoppable Shotgun and Overload Machine Gun are here as well. Overload Machine Gun stunning instantly, I believe, which is very nice. Machine Guns seem like they have some potential, but with how strong and efficient Linear Fusion still are, we'll see about that. Anti-Barrier Sniper has made its return at a whopping 6 energy. Considering how Arbalest still beats Snipers to death thanks to Intrinsic Anti-Barrier one-shotting shields and Disruption Break... I'd be very surprised to see people breaking out snipers for champions and GMs this season, especially at 6 energy. Overload Machine Gun is 1, but Anti-Barrier Sniper is 6? I get that you're very safe while breaking the barrier, but... Dude, inflation is out of control. I believe the mod of the season is going to be Lightning Strikes Twice. I think a lot of people are going to build around that. Thunderous Retort is probably going to see a little bit of play, but it doesn't add to a build. It just makes your super deal more damage, which Titans and Hunters are probably going to love. Amplified Lasting Even Longer I don't think is even really necessary, but at the cost of one and without the ability to combine the more expensive mods in the same class item, I just can't really hurt. Trace Evidence, defeating combatants affected by arc debuffs, spawning arc traces. This definitely has some synergy with stuff. I'm thinking Spark of Beacons combined with other blinding effects, allowing you to just chain blind everything and then also get energy back. That might be pretty neat. Sundering Glare doesn't stack with Divinity, so while that was good the last time it was here, I think the verdict is still kind of out. But it certainly makes running without Divinity a little more viable and or not as painful. And then Lightning Strikes twice, more grenade energy after using a grenade with the timer getting longer after arc final blows. I think every class has some sort of positive way to interact with this mod. I find it interesting that Bungie didn't go for any sort of a melee-based mod or an elemental well-based mod. Maybe they thought the subclass was already so melee-focused that they wanted to round it out with some other stuff. Not really sure. Uh, what else we got? King's Fall. We're going to talk about in another video altogether, but feedback on the raid itself has been very positive as far as I've seen. But I do want to talk about both the day one and the non-day one experiences. I think that is about it for first impressions. Things are shaping up to be another Destiny season. I think the only thing that would change the tide or change how I'll feel at the end of this season is if something truly crazy happens, you know, secret mission, stuff along those lines. But uh, otherwise, for now, it's feeling like another Destiny season. You know, feeling like another Destiny season. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.